test new gear with Joel Salatin. I don't know who you can test it with. So he's just, he has reformed uh, agriculture as we know it, and he's going to help me reform technology and live streaming today. Uh, before we go into that, though, don't forget you can support my work by going to allisonwinepromo.com, allison with one L, winepromo.com. You get 50% off my favorite Molbex from Argentina. I don't know if Sal Salatin makes wine yet. I'm going to have to ask him. But you can go to uh, uh, his wine, too. But if you also want to support my wine, go to allisonwinepromo.com. 50% off the wine itself. 50% off shipping. High altitude. I ski at 3,500 feet. One of these wines comes from 9,000 feet. And it's a great conversation starter. You haven't talked to your grandma in three years because of what you've been watching on the news. You're going to invite her over. Get her drunk on my Malvex, and she's going to forget about everything you said to her and the fact that you unfriended her on Facebook and all that stuff. So bring Allison Wine Promo with you. Also, don't forget you can go to TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Allison. You get USDA certified organic, but who cares about the USDA anyway? Uh, but you get light roast, dark roast, and there's also a tea, which is uh, Katura tea, the fruit around the coffee bean. Small family-owned company, too, just like the vineyards where you get my wine, and um, it's another great way to support my work. So I'm looking at the technical director, and I'm going to bring in Joel right now. Does everybody see him? All right. How are you doing? I think we've made it so far. I'm doing great. Yes. <laughs> We're all here. Okay. All right. So, Joel, um, I think you need no introduction, but I'll just briefly say uh, you're one of my – one of my heroes, really, one of my favorite authors. Um, I have Everything I Want to Do is Illegal right here. I recommend it to everybody. And I'll intro this by just saying that as somebody who has, when I was an environmental reporter in the Seattle area, I covered a lot of agriculture because, as you know, agriculture is an environmental issue. And um, it really gets dichotomized, I think, falsely as a Republican versus Democrat thing or uh, you love the environment uh, or you and you love government, or you hate the environment, you hate government. There are these, I think, really false dichotomies out there. And it was difficult, honestly, I think, in the Seattle area to cover it because what I found was just like you had to fit into these very hard-lined tribes. Um, and what I loved about the work that you've done is that when I would interview farmers who maybe have different backgrounds politically, they all agreed with like most of the stuff you said. And I found that really fascinating. There was this guy that was able to to touch on uh, these different topics that would otherwise, in my industry, polarize people. You were unifying people. So that my first question, I guess, is could you talk a little bit about that? I, you know, is that, that just something – did you know you were doing that when you got into talking about, uh, you know, regenerative farming or however – I don't know if you call it clean farming, whatever your, your terminology is nowadays. Uh, did you think that that was going to be a challenge for you? And how did you begin addressing that? Yeah, well, I have this. Uh, thank you, Allison. It's really a, a delight to be with you. Uh, I, I grew up in this very uh, eclectic home where we were uh, politically and religiously very conservative, but we, I mean, libertarian even, but we were, we were hyper environmentalists. We all, you know, we never used chemicals, comp you know, we built compost piles. And, and so I grew up in this, in this, um, uh, this bridge, I call it a, a bridge home. Uh, and then during high school and college, um, I, I was on the, the interscholastic and intercollegiate debate teams. I have a room full of debate trophies. And one of the things you learn in debate is there are always two sides to an issue. And so when, when uh, so uh, my, you know, my first thought in this, you know, in, in a response to the question is, where I find myself, you know, kind of veering away from many of my friends on on both sides of the aisle is that I actually believe everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but basically I assume that even people I disagree with are well-intended. I, I don't question intent. I assume that, that whatever you're saying, you believe, whatever you think, you're well-intended. I even think Bill Gates is well-intended. Now, a lot of people are starting to really, you know, disagree with me on that. But, but, uh, but, but I, I, you know, I find that you have a lot better, that that's when there's no conversation. We can't, we, where do you, where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. And so, so for me, it, 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 the platform for this is attitudinal. It's attitudinal, me, me respecting and honoring and assuming that you have good intent, even if I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with you. I get a lot of flack with that because I tell people quite a bit that I never, never talk to a manager or a reporter 
who said, well, Allison, you know, we get paid a lot of money by big pharma. So even though we know better, we have to shill for big pharma. They were all true believers and uh, really bought into, I mean, they were, you know, people that were manipulated by propaganda, just like everybody else. They're human beings and they, they suffer the same, the same change blindness and, and uh, ideological shadow that everybody else does. When you start to wake up, then you say, could I even stay in the system anymore? Because I think the system's kind of set up to maintain a level of ignorance. I always say that if the news would come on at five o'clock and, and they don't have to say, you know, this is terrible, we're about to show you, but they could just say, be honest and say, we don't really know what we're talking about, you know, because they, a lot of times that's really the problem. They don't give reporters the time to do the research they need to do. And I think that's intentional in part, not necessarily intentional to mislead people, but I think it's intentional for profit. And, and uh, you know, similar things happen in the food world. Uh, but, you know, it, I think if you don't address the problem at its root, you're going to come up with a solution that doesn't really address the issue. So like you were saying, if you go at it, all these people are trying to, uh, they know better, but they are trying to do, um, you know, evil uh, because they want to just make a lot of money or they want to do this. I, I do agree with you. Some of the people who are doing the greatest harm go to bed at night, I think, feeling uh, pretty good about what they've done. Like they're saving the world. Uh, some some sense of benevolence. I don't know if that's that's what you think, too. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, one of the most uh, interesting conversations I ever had was once I was down in, in Richmond testifying about a, a cottage food bill. There was a, a bill trying to give uh, t trying to give farmers more, you know, more freedom to sell into the market and taking off some of these very onerous prejudicial uh, regulations. And the uh, the head of the Virginia, the uh, food in, in Virginia, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, during a break, he pulled me aside and 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 he said, uh, Joel, he said, we can't let people make their food choices. We couldn't build enough hospitals fast enough to handle all the sick people buying bad food from bad farmers. And 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 and, and you know, and, and he meant it sincerely. You know, I, I'm sure he he takes his kids to soccer and he, he likes to go out and eat it, you know, at, at places. And I expect he's a very loving, you know, husband and father. Uh, and, and and so it's really important for us to just take the time to honor and respect what where the other person's coming from, you know, before we before we split up. I mean, another great example is the is the net the farmers in the Netherlands. Oh my, talk about you know the the the, the you've got you know the government telling the farmers they've got to they've got to cut down their production and the farmers saying government's telling me what to do and and they're they're opposite each other. The fact is there there is there is there is truth on both sides. The farmers are producing you know, a lot more manure than the country can handle. I mean, I, I've been on, I've been there several times. I've been on 10 acre farms with a hundred dairy cows, 10 acres can't handle a hundred dairy cows unless you feed them stuff that only comes from Paraguay and Uruguay and send back dehydrated poop on a ship. You know, that's what they're doing. And, and so, so I understand the environmentalist concerned about turning the country into a, to into a toilet bowl. I also understand the farmers that have invested all this and they're here and now they're being told they can't be viable. So the, the, most of these things have two sides. And I think it, I think you go into an argument better uh, understanding that, that the other side is not, uh, is not full of evil and hatred and, and, and all that. Um, and you can have a lot better conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes which i use quite a bit is that is uh from c.s lewis uh, i'd rather live under a robber baron than a moral busybody basically because the robber baron's cupidity will sleep you know and you can it convict them at some point but the the person who tortures you yeah. with the approval of their own conscience you know is the hardest one to to deal with because they they you know they they do it with the approval of their conscience very very much so and so okay let's talk about then how does the media play into this because like you basically said you could see both sides but that's not something that my old industry does very well they typically want to divide people into one side and make you very skeptical and i think create a lot of animosity towards the other side so that uh well you keep coming back to them i mean that, that's i think in, in part the 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 goal so like last year i um not this past thanksgiving but i'll show this article real fast i did um a video about NBC suggests not having Thanksgiving turkey this year to deal with inflation costs. This comes from Fox News Channel. So they they show that NBC 
is telling you just forgo the turkey because it's too expensive, even though, well, we'll go down that route of, of food costs in a second. I'll wait. But so it's too expensive. Just have lasagna. And then that'll have this added bonus of fewer people will come to your Thanksgiving dinner. So it's cheaper anyway. So fewer friends, it's cheaper. You know, your family's not there. So you're isolated with your lasagna and it's a great Thanksgiving. That's their answer. Fox News Channel then is like, well, this is terrible. If you're a real American, you'll go buy a butterball. So, so show your patriotism and go to the grocery store and get your butterball and tell NBC to, you know, screw, screw off, you know, go somewhere else, screw you. Um, so how does the media can keep this cycle going in your opinion? Well, uh, uh, again, and your response to that was just superb was that, well, there's another alternative. Uh, don't go buy a butterball. Go fair, Go find your local uh, uh, farmer that uses G- um, GMO-free feed and maybe has the turkeys out on pasture like we do and, and get your turkey from them. That creates a whole alternative, uh, a parallel universe. I, I think I think that, uh, that the problem is most people only see two alternatives. Maybe that's one of the problems with just having a Republican and Democrat. Uh, you know, I'd love to see about five parties vying for, you know, maybe maybe the winner gets 30 percent of the vote, you know, and and then there wouldn't be these great big mandates to, you know, now guy gets 51 percent. I have a mandate, you know. To, no, you don't. You, you 49 percent of people don't agree with you. Um, and, and so and, and so the, the options, the options that the media presents uh, the one option is an anti-person, anti-social, uh, you know, anti-animal, uh, anti-farm uh, 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 version. And, and, and the other one, Fox News, of course, they're going to be on the other side and they're just going to present industrial food mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, that option. But there's another option. And I think I think one of the biggest problems in, in the culture is that we that we we bifurcate along very narrow stereotypes and don't actually cultivate in our own minds or in our own friendships the the third fourth fifth alternative view that there, there are there are other ways to to do to to do it and um and i i just think that's that's where we're you know that's where we're weak P- partly because we don't have time to even look at the other sides. I mean, it's one of the reasons I, you know, I, I don't want to vote either Democrat or Republican because both parties shut out the libertarians, the greens, the socialists, and I'm not a socialist and I'm not, you know, but, but, but I want to hear what they say, because a lot of times they, they do have, even the socialists sometimes have a good idea. Uh, the libertarians have a good ideas. And what's wrong with having all the ideas debated on a stage? What's wrong with that? What could it? What harm could it possibly do? If if the Democrats and Republicans really want to be inclusive, why not cultivate debates with these minor parties and bring these views to the forum? Uh, well, the worst that can happen is uh, somebody has a really good idea that uh, that that has never seen the light of day, and well, maybe we ought to try that. And uh, you know, like 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 you know, like r- right now in Virginia, uh, there's a bill right now in Virginia. I know it'll be defeated, but it's interesting. Um, it, it's basically allowing allowing a farmer and a consumer to do business with a signed waiver. So so as as consenting adults with exercising freedom of choice in a voluntary atmosphere, the the consumer uh, um, uh, recognizes full disclosure. All right. I know the government hasn't hasn't approved this food, but I've I've come here, I've looked around, smelled around, asked around, and I want this chicken, or I want this pot pie, or I want this bologna, all right, that this farmer has put together. Um, we should be able, as consenting adults, to engage in a in a food transaction as neighbors without a bureaucrat being involved. And 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 that's that's a that's a completely different alternative. Than the the Democrats who want to control everything, and the Republicans who want to uh, uh, subsidize you know a uh, uh, corporatocracy everywhere, and and this is this is a completely different uh, individualized uh, liberty driven um, alternative that of course you know doesn't see the light of day. So let me give you a quick anecdote from my time in corporate news, and you tell me what the food version of this is related to what you're just talking about. There was a 
a bunch of hoopla about Trump doing something to the Clean Water Act. I can't even remember what it was. But I come back to the station and I've interviewed a couple people about it. And keep in mind, I had maybe two hours and I did everything myself for most stories. I, I shot the video. I did all the editing. I wrote the story. I voiced the story. Go on television. I did everything. So I didn't know where in your day you have time to read the Clean Water Act, much less the Senate report that I really needed to read, which kind of described how we got to this juncture where people were like, we need to gut some of these lines. And I knew enough at that point to know that it wasn't as simple as you like the Clean Water Act. You're a good person who likes the environment. You hate the Clean Water Act. You must be a terrible person who just wants to pollute. And so I wanted to read the Senate report. I, frankly, I really wanted to read the Clean Water Act, but I knew that wasn't going to happen that day. I come back. I say to the person sitting to my right who had been in the business for 45 years, longtime anchor in the Seattle area, you know, hey, I'm I'm a little concerned. I'm going to go on TV and say uh, – that I'm like kind of an authority on this. I mean, I'm not going to say that, but I'm, obviously I'm going on the news. So that's kind of the, the signal I'm sending people, right? Like I was saying at the beginning of the stream, if they would just go on and say, hey, we gave our reporters two hours to do this. We don't really know what we're talking about. Thanks for watching us tonight. I'd be totally fine with that. Unfortunately, they say we're the most trusted name in news, the most accurate name in news, whatever else. Don't listen to anybody else. And I think that's the problem, really. It's just the dishonesty there. So I say this to her. I'm not going to be able to read the Senate report I really need to read. And she goes, well, just say what NBC says, because we were an NBC affiliate. And she's like, they're usually right. So just copy and paste, basically recycle what they're saying, and then just put it on as if it's oh. ours. And, you know, it's all good. What, that, that, that to me was not a, a good enough answer. That was, I think, probably like four weeks before I resigned from my job, because I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, what is the food version of that? Well, <clears throat> so, <laughs> oh boy, there's so much to unpack there, but I, I would simply, back up and say all of these all of these issues like this they they didn't just happen overnight and they didn't happen without a context and so one of the problems with let's just take the clean water act one of the problems there is that in, in our country we have deviated from common law common law solutions and have gone to a, a technocracy uh, or, or a bureaucratic solution so uh, a lot of people don't realize that common law grew up from the commons. That's when the lords and the noblemen, you know, owned all the property and the commons were carved out. So the average peasant had a place to have a cow, a garden, a, a sheep, and, 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 the, and the lord and the, the royalty could not encroach on the commons. And, and if somebody abused the commons, they could take them to a magistrate. And that was where the, the jury of your peers came in. Uh, and it was adjudicated whether or not somebody was abusing the commons. And and so in our country, uh, for example, the way the way I would take care of the environment is I would simply <clears throat> I would simply have uh, reinstitute the the English common law uh, 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 principles and and bring to the magistrate you know uh, uh, pollution or or problems, and then the the community would you know, as a jury of peers, the community would arbitrate it. That keeps it out of all the, the politics that the problem is when we arrogate, here's the problem, Allison, when we arrogate to the federal government issues that have, that have localized, uh, uh, customized nuances, not only do we create a one size fits all mentality, we also make a winner takes all mentality. And so instead of having instead of having many different kinds of experiments, what's called the, the 50 state experiment, what we have is a federal one size fits. Uh, that's one reason why there's so much partisanship is because is because the stakes are so high when it's a nationwide winner or loser. But if it's if it's if it's if it's a winner or loser in a locality, the stakes are not as high and the partisanship then doesn't have to, to be so big. I mean, in, in some cases, from a local local standpoint, there are things that, that I might be in favor of almost that I would sound like a communist all right, on, on a local level. But but I, you know, I, I'm glad to, I'm glad to let a local level uh, experiment with something, you know, proof of concept with something as opposed to having to arrogate everything to the national. I think I think arrogating all these things to the national level has 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 created uh has created a, a bigger whatever a bigger contest you know a bigger war a bigger battle than than it than it should be 
and um, and so so the Clean Water Act is a perfect example of where of where the impatience and the desire to impose on a national level uh, uh, creates more. The, the cure is worse than worse than the disease. Mm-hmm. And when you 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 were talking about um, a little bit, you were talking about kind of the problem with centralization. Yes. How, I guess, how in your opinion would you, if you were say you were me, put yourself in in my shoes? You're an environmental reporter in Seattle, because frankly, like I, I really do think that the same thing exists with news. Like the the closer to the local issue you are, the more likely you're going to get it right in understanding what's going on. So a local news reporter is very good, or I'll say usually good, at going down the street if somebody gets shot and uh, figuring out what happened. Or there's a city council meeting and you're sitting in the city council meeting and you're interviewing the city council members yourself. We're not great when we start localizing national issues like, oh, uh, I remember one of the things that I was just beating my head on my desk over was uh, Trump didn't want to get... did he get the vaccine? I don't even remember if he got the COVID vaccine. I can't remember. All I, I know, you know, the whole warp speed thing, but I, I don't remember if he did. But anyway, he goes to the hospital, remember, and then he does his, um, you know, he gets in his chariot and goes around outside and, you know, waving to everybody. And, um, oh, yeah. It, okay. So, right. So the story was, well, will Trump supporters want to go get the COVID vaccine now that Trump got COVID? That's what it was. Okay. So Trump gets COVID. Are the Trump supporters going to want to get the COVID vaccine now that they've seen that, you know, their hero is... Um, is sick and uh and so they were already kind of like looking for the answer when they went out to, to start with the story but stuff like that is you know because then all you do is you just go outside walmart and you ask for the first five people that you meet you know are you a trump supporter yes okay are you gonna go get the vaccine no i'm not because uh new world order and satan you know and they're like oh it's great i'll just put that in the news and then you act like that's <laughs> You know, like that's what everybody thinks. Uh, that's what local news is terrible at. But they do a lot more of that now because there's fewer people staffed and more live programming. And so they're just looking for anything to just throw on the wall, like a national story, because they just don't have time to send their local reporters out because there aren't enough of them, um, you know, to go out and actually cover the local news. So they just say, what's CNN doing today? We'll just stand outside Walmart and ask them about this story. Um, you know, and that does seem like that's that's happening in the food business. That's how it gets centralized. And then you have more problems with um foodborne illnesses you have more supply chain issues i just i'm just sure. like what happened to us why is it happening to every industry it seems like doesn't that, it just seems weird to me we're all following the same path well i i think it's partly because because we are we've become so peer dependent and uh and unsympathetic to alternative views that we feel like there needs to be one canon, you know, one, you know, one, one theology, one systematic deal, right? That that uh, that that comes from on high that everybody's supposed to agree with. And if if you don't buy into it, then you're whatever. You're not a patriotic. You're not whatever. And and I think you're exactly right. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I was a journalist. I don't know whether whether you know this or not. I was a I was an investigative reporter on the daily newspaper for uh, about two and a half years before returning to the farm full time. Lo- you know, local daily newspaper, town of twenty thousand. You know, circulation of twenty thousand. Back in the heyday of print news, and uh, and uh, you know, you're you're exactly right. The local stuff simply because there aren't as many. There aren't as many dark shadows, but you go to the national level and there's 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 every kind of dark shadow out there that you that it's just very, very difficult to run down. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. And on a local level, the, the chains aren't quite as long and they aren't quite as sophisticated. You know, you can mm-hmm. you can you can get to the chain, you can get, as we say, to the bottom of it uh, a little quicker than you can on the national level because it's so it's just so intricate uh complex and obscure okay let me uh let me get to some questions for you real fast uh so just so everybody knows if you're watching somewhere else um you probably heard my pitch before but if you go to allisonmorrow.locals.com you can become part of my editorial board and submit questions ahead of time for interviews it's five bucks a month it's free if you want the content but if you want to submit questions five bucks a month great way to support my work and uh, also just go just go uh, direct with some of the most censored people on the internet. Um, all right, let me scroll all the way down to the first person here. Oh yeah, there were a lot of people who wanted to know about um, Amos Miller, the uh, Amish farmer who's been in the news uh, 
after uh, well, we had Robert Barnes on the attorney. I think you were on sidebar, right, with him and Viva, and um, talking about that case. We just want to know your opinions about it. Oh well, uh, I don't. I don't know all the final things. I know that uh, that our friend uh, Robert Barnes has been able to punch through a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that were devastating to Amos Miller. But Amos Miller represents uh, right now. I mean, he is the lightning rod uh, of the uh, the private membership association way to to transact food business. So people need to understand that when tyranny gets gets uh, uh, bad enough then it's it's easier to circumvent than than comply uh circumvention versus compliance and so you know those of us in kind of in this alternative uh non-chemical direct market food business have been you know trying to comply trying to you know fit our our square pegs through the round holes for a long long time but it's gotten so bad that it's actually become more efficacious to actually circumvent rather than comply and amos miller is a is the poster child for the private membership association which is modeled after the country club private membership associations which do not have to abide by you know anti-discrimination disabled things and i'm not opposed to any of any of that i'm just saying that that this is a this is a legal mechanism to say this is private, it's not public, and so we can do our own thing. And the courts recognize that. And Amos applied it to food, and and the government said no, that you know that that that's inappropriate. And he has now. My understanding is he's pretty much won his case, and uh, this is going to create tremendous precedent around the country. There are thousands of farmers like me around the country watching him. Uh, and if if this had gone very much against him, you know, it would have put a damper on the circumvention strategies, but it did not. And so this is creating a little bit of a little bit of a shot in the arm for all of us that are looking to how do we how do we circumvent? How do we how do we just circumvent these regulations that keep neighbors from being able to do business uh, between neighbors? And uh, and so it's it's a really exciting thing. I'm very happy for him. And uh, very much appreciate that Robert Barnes uh, stepped up to this and took this case. It's a it's fantastic. I think he actually has a little bit left to. I think they staved off the jail time for now or the fine, but I think he still's got a, a couple a couple legs to run on this one. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's right. I, and I, I've actually been trying to find out exactly where it is from a from a sympathetic attorney friend of mine that watches and knows all the the, the legalese. But they, I mean, listen, listen. Having been in this space for a long time, for the government to release impounded food, remember, this is food that they said yeah. is inedible, inedible, and must be destroyed because it is it is a hazardous hazardous material. For them to pull their police tape off and say, "Okay, you can now uh, uh, sell this," to, you know, you, you're not selling it. You, you can now let your people eat this um, because this is not a sale. It's a it's it's an investment. It's a dividend, not a sale. Uh, anyway, a little bit of legal uh, jargon there, but uh, but but to release that, I mean, that is almost unprecedented. Uh, Government SWAT teams have come in and confiscated milk and made, you know, and, and and poured it down the stream. All this, I, I just have not seen um, um, confiscated food like this be released. I, it just doesn't happen. And so that's a huge thing. Yes, there are absolutely more hurdles, and many of us are watching how this how this proceeds through the courts uh, at this point. One question I meant to ask you earlier before we even got into this, but I think does touch on the Amos Miller case is the idea of endorsement by association. And one thing that uh, I've noticed has taken place in the world of journalism is that if you're interested in learning about somebody's ideas, even if it's somebody like you're going to interview Jeffrey Dahmer, I mean, you, you want to figure out like, how, how does that guy how does that guy do what he did? Uh, and you want to understand his mind. Well, that was journalism 10, 15 years ago, but nowadays that's like endorsing Dahmer. If I go and I talk to you, um, Washington Apple story. Sorry, my husband handed me a sign. I'm trying to see what that, <laughs> he's got to explain that. Anyway, let me go back to this one. Then I'll go to the Washington Apple story. When I understand. This is how we run the show. It's a real, it's actually like a real farm of communication here. This is how it works. Anyway. So, um, so yeah. So, what was I even talking about, Joel? Remind me. What was my? Yeah. So I, I think you've put your you've put your finger on something. Oh, that's... the endorsement. 
Yes. Okay. Wait, let me finish that real fast. So yeah. So yeah. you're, you're endorsing the idea. Okay. So fast forward now you, you have Robert on, right? Well, I had Robert on. Okay. So I have Robert on and he's telling me how it's been somewhat difficult for the, the, um, communication and, and marketing actually in the person who works behind the scenes with Amos was telling me this too, because once again, you come up against this wall of people who are like, I care about the environment. Um, but I don't want to fight. I like the government. The government's here to help. Or I, I hate the government and I don't care about food like this, this, again, this false dichotomy. So it's been, it's been a difficult case from like a marketing standpoint to, um, break through some of that. I I think those preconceived notions about who cares about food and who likes the government and and that kind of thing. And so like, I, 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 I see that very similar, like this idea that, you know, I, if I associate with you, or I want to know more about you, then all of a sudden, you know, I endorse everything you say. And so then therefore I just never go seek out your ideas at all. I don't want to, I don't want anyone to know that I'm associating with you. I only DM you in private. You know, I'm not willing to let anybody. So, so what do you think about that? How does that affect food? Yeah, well, it, it does. It does. It's, it, it, it kind of speaks to censorship. Uh, we've come to this censorship point where, you know, if, if I, if I dare to even have a conversation with you, then, you know, I, I should, I, I, if you're on the fringe, uh, I should either n- not, not expose myself to your idea. Even the exposure of myself to your idea indicates that I must, I'm, I'm friendly to your idea. No, it doesn't. It means, it means that I'm just curious. I'm interested. Uh, but we, we have come to this point of, of censorship uh, in our culture so profoundly that, that it, so social media then prohibits me from even having a conversation with someone with whom I disagree because even the conversation itself gives it it gives it it it, it gives a uh, uh, verbaliza- it gives vocalization to to a terrible idea what's the terrible idea well the terrible idea is that uh, that maybe neighbors should be able to um, to trade food across the fence without a bureaucrat involved. I was in I was in California several years ago speaking at a college. And I had three hundred kids, three hundred college kids in a room. I asked them to the room. I said, I said, how many of you think that in order for you to eat a carrot from your own garden, a a a U.S. dub you know food official should have to sign off on that carrot that it's safe for you to eat? And one third of the hands went up. <laughs> that's depressing. That's what we're dealing with <laughs> from your own garden. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with. And, and, and so, you know, th- this is, um, this is what we call, you know, the, the, the nanny state, the big, you know, and, and um, I'm not an anarchist. I think there should be government, but, uh, but I, I'm also a, a lover of liberty and freedom. And I, and I think when the government gets between my, my lips and my throat, that's an invasion of privacy. I mean, we, we say we want the government out of our bedroom. We want the government out of our womb, but we're happy to have the government in my stomach. Give me a break. You know, <laughs> let, let's have something that the government doesn't penetrate. Speaking of that, what did you think of the, the register your garden story that was going around? Do you see that? You know, you can register your garden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a Trojan horse. I mean, all these things, and and, and you know what, I, I'm, I, I even something like that, where you know most of my friends just go apoplectic over. Yeah. I, I don't assume that the people promoting that are are uh, evil intended. I, I think they actually think, that, just just like the people that want the government to do everything, they actually believe that the government is more honest and honorable and fair than individuals, than businesses, things like that. I don't, I, I, I don't think the government's more, but, but I understand how a person can believe that, can think that, and I can respect and honor them, even though I couldn't disagree with them more. I, I think they're just miss, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're just wrong. They don't, they don't get that. But, um, but I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, if we if we can't if we can't preserve the ability to have a respectful civilized conversation with someone that doesn't see eye to eye with us talk about retreating into your silos you you just become more and more you know vituperative uh in your own in your own explanation of your own position and myopic unexposed i mean exposure 
is one of the best things that you can do for your own, you know, for your own, uh, uh, whatever decision making is exposure to other ideas. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that, that we, we don't actually embrace or run, you know, when people ask me, what's the greatest blessing of your life? It is that I grew up in a home that embraced the, the different idea and, and, and that didn't, uh, run to partisanship and let's find our, you know, find our pigeonhole. Uh, instead, you know, we were all over the board. You know, that's why I, uh, I say I'm, I'm a Christian libertarian environmentalist capitalist lunatic. Um, <laughs> don't put me in a box. And, and, and I, I think exposure, we, we should actually, we should actually embrace and run toward exposure as opposed to cowering and hiding from exposure to other ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I, when I went to seminary, one of the more fascinating phenomena to watch was how many people became atheists in seminary because they came with very, I think, hardline views that had never really been challenged. And then, you know, you, oh, I went to a Boston University, which is, I mean, if you come out a Christian out of, after that experience, <laughs> it'll be fascinating for you uh, ideologically because it's, I mean, it was a very, you know, it's, it, it, there are seminaries out there, I think, they're all different, as you probably know. But Boston University was very, I don't even know what to call it. Um, I guess a lot of people call it liberal. I'm, I'm hesitant to use that terminology nowadays because I don't even know what liberal really means anymore. Now liberal means I want to control you. I, I don't, the terms don't make any sense to me anymore. So yeah. anyway, but, but, it, but a lot of people come like very conservative uh, about and very sort of um, uh, uh, kind of black and white about their belief system and then they they would leave equally black and white but then they would be on the other side they would be an atheist and like I, none of this stuff can be true and um you know I, like having worked in different markets around the country i found if i would talk to people about uh religion if i was talking covering a story or maybe it's just my personal time like if i was in georgia um i had sometimes more interesting conversations with the atheists than i did with the christians because they were they were the minority in that area Whereas when I went to Seattle, the atheists were the most boring people because they were the majority and they had never been challenged. And the Christians were really the more, more interesting people to talk to because they were the minority. So it was, it's interesting to look at it that way. Um, and uh, and I, 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 I think it's interesting that you're saying that, that that exists in the food world, in the agriculture world. Okay. Yes. Yes, it, it absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let, me sh let me get to one more question, too, for you. Um, does Joel use any sensorics or analytics technology to check for possible contaminants. This would apply to any new plot being converted into a farm without solid knowledge of its prior use. Trust, but verify if I am to support an organic farm and I want to, I would like to ensure soil and water powering it are clean. Yeah, well, uh, so the, you know, we've been here on our own farm for now over 60 years. We do lease land in the area and we generally know the know the history. You can tell a lot of history of a of a piece of land uh, just by looking at the vegetation, looking at uh, you know infrastructure, uh, trees, uh, things like that. So uh, there are a lot of things that you can tell. Uh, you know, if I if I was concerned, I would certainly uh, pull some samples. But um, but but in general, uh, you know, we just. No, we're we're pretty we're pretty uh, observational and experiential, and we read the vegetation. We look at the you know look at the worms, uh, look at the soil. And I will tell you this: uh, that if you do happen to get on a place that has uh, a fair amount of of you know whatever uh, some pests, maybe an o o orchards, old orchards are are notorious for uh, you know old heavy metal and pesticide ars arsenic residues, things like that. Um, one of the nice things is that humus in the soil is the soil's Alka-Seltzer. And so you can buffer all sorts of things with enough organic matter. And so, you know, we've taken our organic matter here in 60 years from 1% from up to over 8%. And uh, that really allows for a lot of buffering. So the nice thing about the soil is it is a living thing. It's not an inert substance. It is a very living, responding thing that will respond to your caress as surely as as someone that you hug. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, what is the affordability and availability trade-off? Does this raise the price of food at the consumer level 
Does this model scale to feed urban areas with dense populations? <laughs> Lots of questions from this person. How does this idea compare to agricultural science taught at institutions like Purdue universities? There's, there's a lot there. I think big, big picture, it's like, um, can you feed, you've gotten this question a million times, I'm sure. Can you feed everybody oh with this model? And what about the cost of it? And uh, how does it compare to agricultural science currently being taught? Sure. Well, uh, I can I can dismiss the first one very quickly. Uh, agriculture science is currently being taught uh, take uh, views life as fundamentally mechanical, and I view life as fundamentally biological. Those are two completely opposite views of life: one mechanical, one biological. And the overriding orthodoxy in our whole culture right now, the whole Western reductionist, linear, compartmentalized, disconnected Roman Greco Roman. Uh, uh, um, uh, paradigm is that life is fundamentally mechanical rather than biological, and there are major differences between the two. All right, so that that's that that's the orthodoxy of the day. Now, the the next two questions: um, Can this actually feed the world? Can we grow enough to feed the world this way? And number two: uh, If we could, even can we afford it? So let's let let's let's I'll, I'll try to answer as concisely as I can. By the way, uh, Allison, I give I give a one hour presentation on each of these questions. They're the most common questions everybody asks because they're on everybody's mind. It's fine to talk about, you know, the pigness of pigs and the chickenness of chickens. Um, but but if but if ultimately half the world has to die in order to raise pigs in a way that respects and honors the pigness of the pig, then, you know, it, it, it kind of all falls apart. Yeah, we so need to know I, the, I totally money the money of the money, right? The money of the money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Um, and, and so so uh, the, the the amount of of uh, of scale, you know, can we actually produce uh, enough this way? Um, it's important to realize that right now, biologically, we're spinning circles around the chemical approach. But the chemical approach is so entrenched within our agriculture sector, our farm program, our subsidies, our land grant universities, our science community, that the biological approach can never see the light of day. And the biological approach has only been around basically since Sir Albert Howard wrote an agricultural testament in 1943 and brought the, you know, the uh, the, the scientific recipe for aerobic compost to the planet. So, you know, the the, the chemical versus compost, if you will, uh, ha have kind of risen about the same time since World War II. The problem was that the war effort uh, subsidized the chemical approach dramatically because nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are also the foundations for explosives, which were developed during the war to win the war. And so they got a tremendous amount of... of um, you know, of, of mining and marketing and packaging and distribution uh, uh, help during that time. And it took a while for the the carbon approach, the, 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 the compost carbon approach to fertility to actually come into its being in the, in the late, uh, in the early 60s, once we got, you know, chainsaws and chippers and and, and black plastic pipe and 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 front end loaders and four wheel drive tractors and things like that. So you know, like all all uh, um, uh, innovation, there was a there, there there's a point of the spear and and a ragged metabolism to develop uh, what came up. And so so the compo the, the the Sir Albert Howard composting brought to the world in 1943. Uh, took about two decades for all of the the carbon, the efficient carbon handling infrastructure to develop around that. It's there now. We now spend circles. I mean, our farm produces, you know, th three or four times the county average without any chemicals for sixty years. But you know, it. Uh, so you know, we 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 can do this. It just it just uh, takes some time for the infrastructure to develop. Now let's talk about cost. So the important thing to remember about cost is that the supermarket cash register does not capture the externalized costs of cheap food. So for example, right now, we've just uh, we've just exterminated 58 million uh, chickens and turkeys in the country in the last, what, eight months with this high path avian influenza, um, which the taxpayers are paying indemnification to the farmers for those destroyed birds, plus paying three times as much for eggs in the supermarket. And so you, you get caught both ways. The, the fact is that that when all of the costs are captured, uh, it ultimately is a lower is a lower overall cost. Right now, if I pollute the river out front, 
I don't pay for that pollution abatement. Taxpayers, society pay, pays for that pollution abatement. Uh, I don't bear the cost. And I'm a big believer that if if I done if I've done the pollution, I should have to bear the cost. But um, or, or if you know, right now half of all cases of diarrhea in the U.S. are caused by foodborne contamination. Uh, what's a case of diarrhea worth? Uh, how about MRSA? Uh, MRSA, C. diff, superbugs. These are all these are all externalized uh, uh, costs from a from a cheap food policy. And so all I will say is that the um, you know that that if if you if you bundle up all of the costs into the food item at the cash register and actually have an honest price at the cash register, uh, overall it's it's a it's a it's a cheaper it's a cheaper cost. Now, how can you how can you get your cost down? Well, how you get your cost down is don't buy anything processed. Use your own domestic culinary skill to buy potatoes and make your fries, to buy, you know, ground beef and 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 cook it. Uh, so you get an instant pot, you get a, a crock pot and you 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 get I mean, uh, uh, the most expensive heirloom potatoes on the planet in the green markets of New York sell for $1.99 a pound. Lace potato chips, the potatoes are $2.99 a pound. You've just gone, you look at, you've gone your $1.99 to $2.99 uh, just by buying processed. And we, we've never had more kitchen gadgets, more, you know, more techno glitzy things for our kitchens and been more lost as to where our kitchens are or how to use them. So uh, if, if you buy bulk, you buy a freezer, you buy bulk, you buy volume and you cook it, process it, prepare it, uh, uh, package it and preserve it yourself uh, through canning, through dehydrating, through freeze drying, uh, uh, whatever you want to do, but you actually create your own larder from authentic, unprocessed food, you can let you can eat like a king at half the price. The truth is that those Burger King meals, McDonald's meals, um, you know, Hot Pockets, uh, DiGiorno's frozen pizza, those meals are extremely expensive. If you actually buy the raw ingredients, fix them yourself, you can eat for half the price. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we could look at something like buying a used vehicle or something and do the the calculations on value for something like that, but it, we're we have a harder time doing value for dollar with food. Uh, like my dad's a doctor and often talks about if you paid six dollars for a dozen of really high quality eggs from your buddy you know down the street who feeds their chickens like they live in a palace. It seems like more than. Three dollars at the grocery store, but if you look at the nutrition content of the six dollar yeah. egg, you're getting way more value for your dollar. Whereas, so we just don't think. I don't think a lot that way, and that's that's an interesting way to explain it. Uh, you know, do, do people hear that and then they say that okay, that's an acceptable answer? Or people still push push back on that with you? Uh, well, we <laughs> here at our farm, uh, and we do ship ship internationally. By the way, shameless plug. Uh, if you don't yeah. know where to get stuff, you can get it from us. But uh, but uh, we, we do a lot of messaging, you know, uh, with, with the nutrition. And for example, you know, grass finished beef has 300 percent more conjugated linoleic acid than than uh, than than corn fed beef. Uh, we, we submitted our chicken, our, our eggs to a test. And uh, the USDA uh, nutrition label uh, says eggs have 48 micrograms of folic acid per egg. Uh, our eggs tested 1,038 micrograms per egg. We're not talking about minor differences here. We're talking about major, major, major differences. And so, uh, you know, so so the fact is that in the last in the last uh, what 40 years. Americans have moved. They, they, they. In 40 years ago, Americans spent 18 percent of their uh, income on on food and nine percent on health care. Today, 40 years later, we're spending nine percent on food and 18 percent on health care. And I submit that if we went back to investing more, investing more in our food, we could drop those health care costs dramatically. Food isn't the only thing that makes you healthy or unhealthy, but it is it is a it is a great uh, starting point. And if you and if you if you have a crooked rocket on the launch pad, uh, you might want to change your launch pad at least. <laughs> OK, uh, in your successful farm business, 
Blanket Mom asks, you listed off several types of people who decide to become farmers. You did not have retired military unless I missed that part. I've noticed large number of homesteaders and new farmers are former military. Why do you think that group in particular chooses that path? And what advice would you give this group, relatively young, 35 to 45, obviously motivated with or without kids, since they didn't seem to fit into the groups listed? Uh, yeah, th th I see a lot of retired military people coming to that. And I think I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one is they're not a uh, work sweat doesn't scare them uh they're, they're you know they're in in they've been in physical training they're in pretty good shape and so a little bit of physical work doesn't scare them like it would uh some sort of a you know it computer geek um so that's one thing the second thing is that they have spent a lot of time out here with buddies they've been on deployment they've been out here and 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 um believe it or not we get a lot of of, of prison inmates also uh, making this change when they get out. And the two things that the the uh, military guys and the uh, prisoners and, and gals uh, have in common is uh, many of them for the first, you know, they spend a lot of time just sitting around jawing. And when you sit around and jaw, you start talking about what's important in life. Uh, where do you think the country's going? You know, what what do you really want to do? And, and, and most, uh, a lot of adults don't, once once they're past about 10 years old, they never again have a chance to sit down in a totally relaxed, uh, affirming atmosphere and share dreams. You know, we're busy trying to please the teacher, please the preacher, please the, the, the employee, the employer, please, you know, our peers, uh, please mom and dad, please, you know, uh, all the, and, 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 and so once you're past about 10, you don't enter into that zone of, of, you know, of my dream and, and, and what do I want to do? And the third reason I think that, that uh, so, so, so prisoners and military folks, uh, and I'm not trying to, to, to say they're identical, but they share this, this commonality of, of for the first time as adults, adults being able to sit around a room with a bunch of other unattached uh, uh, dreamy adults and actually, and actually unhurriedly drill down on dream and fantasy. And that's a luxury in, in the adult experience. And the third thing I would suggest is why military folks are drawn to this is because they, they're they aware of, a, of um, uh, what's the right word? They're, 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 they're deeply concerned about where the world is headed and where our country is headed. Uh, I think there, there is a deep uh, un unnerviness right now in, in America, uh, economics, uh, disease, um, uh, water, food availability, food prices, all these kinds of things. And there's a, there's a deep intuitive understanding. If the wheels fall off, I don't want to be in the city. I want to be where I can shoot it here, uh, drink out of a spring, uh, get some firewood. You know, there's that deep sense. And so I think those three things kind of draw the military uh, folks to this. I agree. I I think, um, yeah, that sense of survival, uh, independence, and just having a backup plan that a lot of us don't think about. When you were talking about prisoners, that made me think of the story I did when I was still in corporate news about this guy who was in, I think he was in jail for 20 years, and it was for homicide. Um, he robbed a gas station and then killed the cashier, if I remember correctly. And it was when he was like 16 or 17, he was in a gang. Anyway, this prison had a vermiculture program, and so he got into the vermiculture program, and that's what I was doing the story on, so I interviewed him as part of that. And he told me how he had gone from this guy who had basically like no regard for life whatsoever, not, not even his own, frankly, and that's why he, he was able to take others uh, you know, the, in that uh, robbery. Uh, but he's gone from this, this guy who had really no regard for life to someone who now, when it's raining, he sees a worm on the sidewalk because it gets, pushed, uh -huh. you know, pushed out of the soil and he stops to move the worm and put it back because he sees the value of the tiniest things now. And I mean, I, I just thought that was such an amazing transformation story that that's what, that's what growing food can do for somebody, you know, that you go for somebody who could, you know, have just no regarding, just kill a total stranger to somebody who now mm -hmm. stops to push a worm off the sidewalk and won't even step on a worm. Uh, I, I don't know. It just, it was really interesting to me. Yeah. That, that's a fantastic story. Fantastic.
Okay, one question about, uh, here we go, Dr. Chip Abrahamson, which I will out is my dad. Years ago, <laughs> I heard Joel say the label organic is oversold, that a local farmer spraying a little atrazine occasionally was no big deal, and I have to admit my purchases from a local farmer didn't change when they were certified organic as I had visited the farm. My question is, is there any value in the organic label? Can it ever save a trip to the farm to check them out? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a kind of a, that's a bit of a minefield question. Uh, is there any value? You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say there's no value at all. I will say that since the government, since the government now owns the label, um, it, it, it has now been co-opted by the, you know, by the, um, the soilless, the, the hydroponic folks, the concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, basically, it's like every government, whatever regulatory agency, it's now controlled by the largest uh, marketing interests in that sector, and so it has lost its its uh, its its integrity and and genuineness that uh, Senator Pat Leahy envisioned when he put in the organic uh, bill back, you know, whatever twenty five years ago. Uh, and I, I certainly remember that and remember all that. And and it never it never made sense to me that that all these people that spent their whole lives complaining about uh being maltreated by the usda i call it the us duh um that all these people that had been maltreated by the us duh wanted to give the us duh the regulatory authority over their own you know over their own um you know their own protocols it's like the fox guarding the hen house it doesn't make any sense so I, i'm a big believer in um in, in surfing the website, if you can visit the farm, visit the farm. But you can learn a lot from a website. Be, 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 uh, be astute. I mean, if you go to the homepage, meet our farmers, and there's a farmer standing in, I mean, there's one I know I just looked at, uh, standing in front of a, a concentrated animal feeding operation, holding a chicken, uh, you know, you know, that's actually, a, you know, a, a factory farm. Um, if, if they're using terms like natural, and or the, or or a label doesn't won't let you meet their farmers. For example, they just say we we buy from farmers that use natural products. No, 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 that, that's not good enough. So there are a lot of red flags. I'm actually thinking about doing a a seminar on on what to look for in a website because that's the way we we communicate these days. And and uh, the fact is that you can learn a lot if you're you know if if your antenna is up, mm -hmm. you can you can see a lot. Uh, from either what's missing from a website or what's there, um, you know, as, as you surf a website. But um, the the other thing, of course, is to is to um, to look at social media and what are people saying who have visited there. So one of the things that we have at our farm is we have a 24-7, 365 open door policy. Anyone is welcome to come at any time to see anything anywhere unannounced and unescorted that's our commitment to transparency and and um and and so you you know uh, you might have a friend that's in the area send them out you know uh yeah you don't have to actually drive here if you're in whatever um you know chicago uh you know somebody in here send them out uh there's there's nothing wrong with that my, my basic point is that if we're going to if we're going to be responsible for our microbiome what the fuel for our microbiome we need to not just assume that a the government has our back or that 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 commercials or brands have our back we need to we need to participate we need to start asking sleuthing and participating in the system so that we develop a, a a we exercise our discernment muscles our discernment muscles so we know uh who to go to mm -hmm. uh on that note Okay, I'm going for the first time ever going to press a chat and see if it comes up. And it worked. Oh, look at that. Okay, Allison, please ask about farm subsidies and how the government controls the farmers with them. And I think that kind of touches on labeling, too, a little bit. I mean, um, I, I know that's another really big topic, but are those two things connected? How the government helps you with financing and then how you end up with labeling and then what the food ends up looking like? Yeah, well, 
uh, yeah, they, they don't call them subsidies anymore. It's called farm insurance. Uh, that's the new that's the new term. So they're not they're not actually subsidies anymore. Uh, but of course, they, they don't they only offer it to six things, and and, uh, and so they they pick their winners again. It's it's another case of where um, of where the government decides to reward to to pick winners and losers. And when you have that, you have a skewed you have a prejudice within the marketplace. Uh, you know, in my perfect world, there would be there would be no government involvement in agriculture whatsoever. None. Um, in fact, if I may be so bold, in my perfect world, there wouldn't even be a U.S. duh. Uh, you know, we 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 can we can uh, sleuth it out on ourselves. See, the problem is in the in the whatever in the place of ideas, I can present an idea. SDA and the whole conventional, you know, commercial uh, chemical ag complex, the industrial food complex, uh, in cahoots with the academic complex against me. But if there were no government government involvement in food, then it would be me against Monsanto. I can hold my own against Monsanto any time of day. The problem is when Monsanto walks in a room, they have three PhDs from Purdue University, Indiana University, Ohio University, and suddenly everybody's skewed and I don't get a seat at the table uh, because it's, you know, it, it's a stacked deck. And so, um, so, you know, I, I, I certainly don't see any benefit at all, any benefit at all of having the government involved in our food system, our agriculture system, our uh, any any of that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can say, well, you know, they they equalize things, they make things fair, they keep it from being a wild west, uh, whatever. Well, you know, uh, the fact is, there is no perfect system this side of eternity. There is no perfect system. So you have to weigh the risks, the risks of corruption, of 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 unfairness, um, all those things you have to wear the weigh the risk of that in a decentralized competitive system versus a centralized bureaucratic system. And I will take I will take the chance the the risk of of bad things happening more in a decentralized democratized competitive system than in a centralized bureaucratic system. Okay. Be, be the one up in the perfect world, but I'll take the one over the other. Okay, here's a question about uh, Sheila Sue. My oldest son is breaking into regenerative farming. He was at your farm, which has a tiny house now. You can do a tiny house vacation, I saw, um, at Polyface. So he's there past summer for a conference. Josiah's question is, how did does he develop his criteria for saying yes or no? to opportunities both from an agriculture perspective and a public life perspective? That's a really interesting question. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, why did you say yes to this interview, Joel? Like, this crazy lady. Um, I, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. Is he saying that that if he if he goes into farming, he'll be a hermit? Is that the question? No, I think, um, so he's saying how how did you develop your criteria for saying yes or no to opportunities like in life? Like, how do you decide? Yes, I'm going to take, I'm going to go to the meeting. I'm going to take this opportunity both in agriculture and life. Um, you know, public life. How do you, how do you determine? Cause you get lots of offers. Let's do this. Let's do that. Uh, it sounds like it's, it's that kind of question. How do you, how do you decide what you're going to say yes to and what you're going to say no to? Oh, uh, okay. That's a, that's a decision, a decision making framework uh that's a <laughs> yeah that's a big question uh you know if, if i had a, if i had a magic bullet for that i you know i'd be a millionaire i expect but um but i i guess i guess the the my main answer would be you have to know who you are and i would just tell um what the boy the the young man's name is josiah um i i i think that the average person the average person as an adult does not give themselves the freedom to dream, to, to, to dream. Um, we're, we're so busy. I've got to pay this bill. I've got to satisfy this person, that person, expectations here, expectations there, that we never actually take the time to find our true, what am I here for? What am I supposed to do? Uh, what What is my ultimate dream? And then make a life mission statement. 
So, and, and your life mission statement can change, can change. I mean, Teresa and I's first one was make a full-time living on the farm. That's pretty simple. Uh, and so anything that got in the way of that, we weren't interested in. A lot of the times what you say no to is more defining than what you say yes to, because we're always tempted to you know, run them on, 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 on rabbit trails. And so uh, our, our mission statement today is to develop environmentally, emotionally, and economically enhancing agricultural prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. That's our current mission statement. It may change at some point, but but whatever temptation, whatever opportunity comes to us, it is it is pushed through that mission statement to keep us on track. And so, you know, you can have mission statements for different things. We just we just actually um, last, you know, two weeks ago made uh, we, we wanted to refine our mission statement for our marketing efforts. So we made a new a new marketing mission statement. But uh, a mission statement grows out of your soul. It grows out of your heart, out of who you are. And if if you can't if you can't distill your life dream into one sentence, you're not ready to make decisions. Hmm. That that may sound hard, but you know, uh, Allison, I'm sure you must have had uh, some good English teachers in you know in tenth, uh, eleventh, twelfth grade. I had a fantastic one uh for uh for advanced composition in 12th grade i mean that lady she was she was the quintessential you know uh um you know springboard for a writer and um and we did we did a lot of uh essays in there and and thesis you, know, you have to write a thesis and boy if i remember only one thing she said you are not ready to write your paper until you can write your thesis statement in one sentence you know, I've written 15 books. I've just finished a 16th one. And I've learned that's the same thing is true in a book. If I can't distill what I'm going to write in that book in one sentence, I'm not ready to write the book because I'll be all over the all over the planet. And I think the same is true in our lives. If you can't distill, if you can't distill your true you in one sentence, you're not ready to make the decisions for your life. Maybe you need to go on a retreat and sit and think and 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 just um get in a, a a yoga position or pray or whatever you know for a couple of days till you come up with that but but i think i think that that most of us are so most people are so busy we, we see them all the time here our young people that come as apprentices come to the farm they're often 28 29 30 year old people young people a lot of times with advanced college degrees why did you do that well because i was good i was good at this so the guidance counselor just you know said said go down that path I, I'll, I'll finish with this on, on that question i remember like yesterday i still have emotional scars from it uh when i was a rising senior in uh in in high school and uh, i had my last interview with the guidance counselor you know going to make my my um you know my subjects for the next year and she said, what do you what do you really want to do in life? I said, I want to be a farmer. And she about went into apoplectic seizures over what well, you're going to you know, waste all that talent, waste all those brains, waste all, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, she just went nuts. I'll never forget it. And 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 if I had listened to her. I would have I would have never come back to the farm and been a farmer. But it was because it was because I was blessed with. I don't, I don't know what blessed with the opportunity. I, I was blessed with early on uh, as a kid. You know, I got my first chickens when I was 10. I had my entrepreneur business. I sold at the, at the curb market. I supplied schools. I, 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 I did enough things to know that this is what I wanted to do. And the average young person today, we deny them the chance to be paper boys and shelf stockers. All we do is we put them behind screen time, have them play video games, and they hit 20 and don't have a clue what they're good at, what they want to do in life. And, and I think we've abused our children by denying them adult opportunities to interact with the adult world like we used to where they had chores and chop wood and gather eggs and butcher the chickens and plant the beans and help can the corn and, and do all of these things that people did to have a broad platform of experiences in life. So when they hit 20, you know, they knew where they were headed. I mean, think about Buffalo, uh, uh, Wild Bill Cody. Bill Cody, he, he was a Pony Express rider at the age of 13, 
13 years old, he was carrying the U.S. mail across hostile territory on the back of a horse at 13. We live in a different world. Yeah. You know, the bar the bar mitzvah is 12, right? Right. And so how many experiences is your child having by the time they're 12 so that when you ask them, who are you, they can actually give you an adult an adult answer of who they are? My husband just wrote on the whiteboard that the guidance counselor told him the same thing about joining the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, so. Oh, okay. You know, I, and I get that question a lot, too, because I, I have a Master of Divinity degree, and then I went into journalism. And actually I found it just the process of, uh, the three years of thinking through the greatest questions that the philosophers over centuries have been asking was actually one of the best things I could have done to go into a field where you're challenged with interpreting the reality on a regular basis and just being able to sit with all kinds of different people and feel comfortable with them and their ideas. Even if you disagree with them, you're comfortable to sit in the same place with them and to listen to them. And I wasn't going to ask you this question, but I actually think you'd be a great person to answer it. One of the questions I think I, I haven't, I don't have an answer to, but I get quite a bit and I ask myself this a lot is how do you become the person? Like you were saying, maybe you need to sit in a yoga pose or you do this or you do that. But how do you become you? Because there's something I can say about you, Joel, is you're you. You know, nobody could – they could say a lot of things about you, but you're Joel. I mean, no no question, right? You're you're Joel. You're, you're nobody else. You're trying to be somebody else. And maybe there are a lot of people who are trying to be Joel. Um, but you're, you know, you're you, right? And so the, so how do you become you instead of trying to be Joel or trying to be Allison? Um, you know, how do you become you? I, my answer to a lot of people, at least just in my life, has been, it's not, I don't think it's the answer, but like for me, I think the thing that made the biggest difference, if I just look back on the last five or six years, like what ended my career in TV news and then jettisoned me to where I am now is... When I moved to Seattle, I didn't really know anyone, and they have beautiful mountains over there outside the uh, Seattle metro area, and I started hiking for the first time. I'm from Florida. I didn't know I liked mountains. I didn't know I liked hiking, and I'd take my dog with me, and we'd go on these really long hikes, like eight hours or backpacking, spend the night, in the, and I'd never been quiet for that long, ever. I mean, I, I got into talking about you know guidance counselors. I got I worked really hard to get into math honor society because my English teacher told me I'd never be good at math. So I said, oh, I'll show you. So I got really good at math and I got into math honor society. And then I ran for president. So I became president of math honor society. And then I talked so much that my teachers kicked me out for being disruptive. So I think it was the only person who got kicked out of math honor society for being disruptive. But anyway, that's who I am. So, so, uh, you know, fast forward, I finally was quiet because I go on these hikes and, and I started to really enjoy it. I, I enjoyed, you know, I felt like I wasn't alone because my dog was right there, but I, I was not, I was with nobody else. It was me, God in the trees and, and my dog. And I think when I finally got comfortable with solitude, I got comfortable with questions really for the first time, like not having to have noise and answers around all the time, like being able to wait for, for the answers to come. Um, and, and, and I, I always just had to fill everything with noise for so long. And that was one of the first things that I got to know myself. Like I was finally comfortable just being with Allison. I didn't have to be with a bunch of other people. And so then when I finally got comfortable being with Allison, then I could start seeing other people for who they were and systems for what they were. I didn't need them to be what I wanted them to be. So that, that was my, that's my journey. I'm just curious what you think people could, um, could do. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't think I could have articulated that better than you did. I, I concur with you completely. You know, there's a there's a wonderful I think it maybe is a I don't know if it's a Confucius or whatever, but it's a one of the, one of these, you know, great uh, uh, legacy sayings that says all great people. Spend a lot of time walking. And in solitude. And your hiking with your dog by yourself brought you to a place where, as we say around here, you could become comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that we live in a world where very few people are comfortable in their own skin. And I don't mean narcissistic. I don't mean in, I don't mean you know I don't mean Trumpish. I don't mean in love with yourself. Okay, but 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 I mean I mean, you know I. I am the way God made me, you know, and, and I can't do this, but I can do that. I don't like this, but I do like that. 
uh, I like these kind of people. I don't like those kind of, you know, uh, to, to be, to be, we, we call it here, uh, happy or, or satisfied in your own skin. We, we view that as, as probably the, um, you know, the, 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 the epitome, the epitome of human expression is when you, when you come upon someone who is, who is happy in their own skin. Um, they understand their weaknesses. I, I certainly, I have weaknesses. Okay. But, 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 but I understand them and I'm seeking, uh, uh for them. I, I know my strengths and I want to, I want to leverage my strengths. Uh, and I know what I, I know what gets me up in the morning. I know what my passions are. And so I want to unleash those passions and not, and not get pulled off of those compassions, uh, those compassions. Uh, I probably could stand some more compassions <laughs> along with my passions, but, um, you know, we were, we were taught, Teresa and I, my wife were talking about this the other day. Um, uh, we had a, had a bit of a, you know, one of these, you know, you're in business and you have relational things happen. Um, and not everything, you know, turn, you, you can't salvage every, you know, every relationship. Right. I mean, sometimes things just don't. And, and, uh, and I just said to her, I said, people have to understand I'm driven. I'm a driven guy. Okay. And, and if, if you don't, if, if being driven offends you or threatens you, or you don't like being around somebody driven, well, you know, I'm sorry, but that that's who I am. And I'm not gonna, I'm not become mamby pamby and, and undriven because somebody is threatened by this, this guy that's, that's driven. And, and, um, and not everybody is, you know, some are, are great followers and we, we need great followers uh, as well as people who are, we're, we're all different. And so for me, um, you had as, as good an answer as anything is to just um, be able to find out, to ask yourself, um, uh, what do you want in life and what drives you, what gets you up in the morning? Uh, you know, there, there are all sorts of helpful questions. Like, you know, if, if, if I had, if I had all the time and all the money tomorrow, uh, that I, that I wanted, what would I do? You know, those are, those are good kind of catalyst or facilitate kind of, of, of questions. And, and one of our problems is in our culture, we, we are just so, uh, helter skelter hurried, uh, that we, we simply don't, we don't have time to sit and think, meditate, uh, have ha, com, commune with ourselves. Just commune with ourselves and enjoy and enjoy ourselves and, and our own weaknesses and our own strengths. That's not a. I didn't answer it as well as you did, but um, but that, that's kind of that's kind of where I am. And and yes, it takes unplugging. Uh, it takes unplugging. It, it takes. Um, I mean, so, so I have a routine on Sunday on Sunday. That's I, I shut the computer and I don't turn on the computer all day Sunday. I, it's, it's, it's a, it's a day of rest from electronics, you know, I mean, I might not watch a movie or something, but, but as far as, you know, emails and, and that, that, that social, none, no, it, it, it's over. And I take that day off one day a week. You know, I, I don't have a smartphone. I, I'm still, you know, I'm still, um, I, I'm still, <laughs> So, you know, so I don't text, I'm not on any social media, I'm not on any Facebook. Um, and, and what I find is that 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 gives me time to just to think, to think and and enjoy, enjoy processing in my own head, things, instead of just constantly being, you know, a, a funnel where everything in the world is just pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. Mm -hmm. And I don't have time to just stop and think and, and sort it out. It sounds like, too, that, that the technology thing really has become a, a legitimate addiction because I, I see videos now about the dopamine release we get yes. from looking at our phones. And so it's not even just a joke. It really is something that it, it, that you got to unplug from, from like a physiological standpoint. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Joel, can I throw you a couple more questions from the viewers? You have a few more minutes? Sure. Okay. Uh, what would be a reference or starting point for people who want to get into gardening? Does he have any starting references for getting community parks and rec involvement in local community gardening and involving groups like the Boy Scouts? 
Oh, well, uh, not necessarily urban, but certainly, you know, uh, uh, that uh, of that persuasion. Um, so there, there is there is lots of material, you know, out there. Um, uh, Eric Sloan, Eric Sloan, of course, is, is the, you know, the urban urban gardener. Um, so, you know, the, these guys are th this material is out there. And I think that. All you need is um, is to get a plot that's unused and uh, uh, start. You'd be surprised how people coalesce around these kinds of things. They they're actually very very healing in a community to to take you know coke bottles and cans and trash and turn it into a, a squash and watermelons and and uh, you know pepper plants and tomatoes. And there, there's there's quite a therapeutic you know. Uh, the whole uh, therapeutic horticulture movement is huge now. Um, you know, it's kind of an offshoot of um, of Richard Louv's, um, you know, uh, nature nature deficit disorder. Uh, you know, th that's all that's all you know tied up in this as as we become so disconnected from our umbilical. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people are attracted to initiatives like that in the urban sector. I mean, you mentioned Boy Scouts, but I mean there are uh, you know. Uh, uh, boys and girls clubs, big brothers, big sisters. Uh, there are any number of philanthropic groups that would be glad to, you know, to jump in on a on a community uh, gardening endeavor like this. So you just need a piece of land and need somebody to to what, stick the flag in the ground and say, you know, let's go. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that those will those just naturally develop. Okay. Uh, does Joel have an opinion on the future of small scale farming, particularly in the Eastern States where the pressure to urbanize is highest? I buy my produce from a small family farm that runs a CSA program and they are great, but it's expensive for most people. Yeah. So yeah, small scale farming. Um, yeah. I mean, there's everything from, from homesteading for yourself all the way to, you know, to small scale uh, this question it seems like it's coming from somebody who's uh, buying maybe from a family that's either part timing it or full timing as a small scale. Um, so, so here, here's where I am. Is there a future? Um, I, I think it's, I think it's a bright future. In fact, I've never been more optimistic about the future of small scale farming, and I'll tell you why. Uh, what happened with COVID was that the fragility, the the fragility of um of of the of the high scaled industrial system became got exposed and um my my quick question to people you know we all know what happened to the to the grocery store shelves in the spring of uh, 2020 when the shelves were bare and here's my question do you think that that we would have had as big a hiccup in the food system had our food come instead of from 300, 5,000 person centralized processing facilities, if instead that food came from 300,000 50 person community scaled processing facilities. I haven't had anybody say, oh, I, I think that the centralized system, uh, you know, served us better. No, actually the decentralized system would have served us a lot better. And so I, I think that what, one of the things that we're we're coming out of here in the last couple of years, and now the now the war in Ukraine, uh, all of this stuff is is shining a light of fragility on the industrial food complex, and this is one of the things that's driving the um, uh, Alice and I, the book I just finished the rough draft of uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it, the the title is Homestead Tsunami. Uh, and, and it's all about this this urban urban to rural e migration of people that realize you know if if the wheels fall off I don't want to be in the city, and uh, and there is just a a steady stream of people um, heading to <laughs> I call them agrarian bunkers, and, and so as this develops I think the small farm the sm the small farmstead holding is going to become the new bedrock. Of, uh, of our food system as these large operations begin to crack and crumble, uh, as, as those castle walls begin to begin to crumble. Uh, what uh, um, 
you know, mixing metaphors here, you know, the, it, it, it took, it took 500 years for metallurgy and horse breeding and, uh, and plant propagation to develop the ultimate war machine, which was the mounted knight uh, from a, from a castle. Okay. And it only took 20 years for that whole system to be, uh, to be destroyed with the invention of gunpowder. Mm -hmm. And so, and so for me, you know, these great big food conglomerates, you know, Tyson, Cargill, they're the, they're the castles of our current food system, but they've got some really big cracking walls. And we small farmers are gunpowder in our culture. We're gunpowder that are, that, that, that are starting to, to um, uh, take advantage uh, of, these, of these cracking walls within the system. And so I'm very optimistic about the future of uh, of small direct market farms in their communities building resilient food systems uh, that can stand the that can stand a war in Ukraine or or a spike in fertilizer prices or avian influenza or you know whatever else uh, there might be. This is an interesting question. I'll be interested to hear your answer on this one. Okay, resident Bedouin asks, since Allison and Robert Barnes have mentioned Joel's book, everything I want to do is illegal. What has Joel learned over the years, both from his legal advisors and personal experience, how to best deal with the government visitors when they visit Polyface Farms? <laughs> <laughs> oh, now that's an interesting question. So, okay, so so here here's my here's my list of things. Um, number one, you never you never talk to them ever. You never talk to them. Everything. So if they visit, bye bye. Uh, you can't come without a warrant. Period. Bring me a warrant, then you can th th then you can come. That stops almost all of it. Uh, and then we never talk. If you're gonna, if you're going to talk to me, do it in writing, and that slows them down by a year because suddenly now if they're going to write something, they have to run it through the attorney general's office and you know blah 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 blah. So that that slows everything down. So um, so number one, you're not welcome here. Number two. Uh, speak to me only in writing, not in, I don't talk to you. I don't talk to you on the phone. I don't talk to you in conversation. Everything's going to be in writing. Every conversation is going to be in writing there that, that creates a, a, um, a legal paper trail for whatever happened, because these guys, they come in, they say all sorts of stupid things, and then they deny it in court. They, it, it's just, it's just unbelievable. So you've got to have some sort of a, a, a paper trail. And the third thing I would say is the other thing that we're, you know, that we've, uh, we've learned is that all of these battles are ultimately political. They're not actually legal. They're, they're actually political. And so, um, so being friends with your elected officials, uh, they have bailed us out of numerous issues, numerous little little skirmishes, and it doesn't matter whether they're Democrat or Republican. Uh, for the Republicans, we're entrepreneurs. For the Democrats, we're environmentalists, and and so you know we 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 get help from from both sides, and um, and you know we invite them to things here at the farm. Uh, most of our elected uh, folks have been here at the farm, and and just remember remember that the the bureaucrat. The only person that the bureaucrat fears is the elected, the elected official, the elected legislator. He doesn't fear you. He couldn't care about you at all. Uh, only thing he fears is the people that are actually paying his bills are the elected politicians. So you want to be friends with them. And the final thing I'll say is, and, and so, so you know, uh, even giving giving to some election uh, things and that showing up at the at the you know uh, the the shrimp fry and that sort of thing, uh, you know, that's that's fine as well. And um, and the other thing is the, the final thing I'll just say is um, when you're negotiating, remember that like has to talk to like. And so, if I'm here talking to some bureaucrat. The bureaucrat has all the power of the state, the attorney general behind him in our discussion. It's not a fair fight, okay? But if my attorney or my uh, delegate or my senator talks to that bureaucrat, suddenly it's like talking to like. You know, in war, in war, a um, if a if if a, if a colonel if a colonel surrenders to the enemy, who comes to meet that colonel? Not a private. Not a lieutenant, not a major, but another colonel. 
Okay, so so think about it like this: you, um, if there's going to be a negotiation of, of a treaty here, it's going to be like on like. Um, you know, uh, uh, President Biden uh, doesn't go meet with the undersecretary of of Xi in China, right? Um, Biden and Xi Xi talk together, but if if they can't, then they each send, you know, their Secretary of State and they talk, or, or you know, whatever the issue is. But like has to talk to like, and so you need to understand your position in this. Um, and it's not, you know, uh, it, it, it's not, you know, you're not bad or you're not, you know, anything. If, if you realize, look, in a negotiation, I need like talking to like. And it's amazing how many times we've had skirmishes. I just give it to, give it to, um, you know, my attorney friend. The attorney writes the letter. It's all done. It's just because it's like talking to like. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um and what you were bringing up too about uh, about just you you feel like you have to say something because you because it's the government people are scared like you you know the IRS and you're like I gotta I gotta I have to send them money I can't you know what are they gonna do the IRS send me a lot and I don't think enough of us feel the uh, the um, calm with the government that we we should that like well that's wait a second it's our government like we pay for <laughs> you know their salaries and they can just wait a second you know we don't have to say anything to them we're not they're not kings um but it's it could be scary and intimidating for a lot of people so that's that's interesting um interesting advice you, you have the right to remain silent yeah nobody can nobody can coerce testimony from you e even in a courtroom you don't have to answer a question mm -hmm. and so so um yeah and, and i i get it you know look we don't want to get in a fight. We don't want to be mean. We don't want to be discourteous. Uh, I mean, for, for direct farm marketers like me, I mean, discourtesy is the worst thing you could ever do. Right. And, and so we have that, but, um, but you have to be, you know, um, wise in this and, uh, and you'd be surprised the kind of setups uh, that people have gotten themselves into um, you know, when they, when they talk too much or sign something, we, we had a, we had a battle one year and the, 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 the food and safety inspection people came in here. Um, they wanted me to make it, I wouldn't make a statement. So they, they wrote a statement and demanded that I sign it. That's your statement. They demand, I said, no, I'm not signing anything. And, uh, and, you know, and, and they, they never could force it. And they finally just went away. They just got tired and went away. And so, um, uh, because you know what, a lot of them are decent people too. A lot of them are decent people and they don't want to have a big fight and a big argument. So if you stand up and don't play the game, you know, they can check their box. Yeah. We went and visited, you know, and <laughs> so they checked their box right. and they got what they wanted. They got their visit in They checked their box and, and, uh, nobody asks them anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like the people you're dealing with, they just want to do their part of the job, which just may just be, I had to go visit Joel's farm today, but I don't really care what happens after that. I just, I just had to, so just let me visit your farm. So the other thing I wanted to say too, is I had this defense attorney on talking about Alec Baldwin the other day, and he was talking about this um, catfish that was mounted on the wall, this defense attorney office. And under it said, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't opened my big fat mouth. And he said, just blame it on the, your attorney. Like, so if, if you, you get pulled over or something, you don't have to go, I'm not talking to you, but you could go, my attorney says I shouldn't talk to you. So that way it's like, not, Hey, look, I'd love to talk to you, but it's my attorney who says that I shouldn't. So you can blame it on them. Um, okay. Here's another question. Well, first a comment, uh, what's on your plate says Joel's book folks. This just ain't normal. Got me through COVID. I read it slowly over time for comfort as needed by copy of everything I want to do is illegal. Just came in the mail today. So somebody is going to start reading that book. You're ill really enjoy it. I, my favorite quote from that book is, um, if the left has lost its mind, the right has lost its heart. I really, I really got a lot out of that book. Cause I, I felt like nobody understood me until I read that book. Okay. Have you been using biochar stoop dog asks, and have you found it beneficial? Do you think it can help us with carbon sequestration? Have you tried mixing it with livestock manure or feeding it to them? There you go. Oh, wow. Biochar. Uh, you know, it's like so many of these uh, elix elixir fixers, uh, magic things. Uh, it certainly has its application. We certainly use charcoal. Uh, we, we've not made, you know, purest uh, biochar. Uh, I've fooled around with some. Uh, we are we are actually running a, um, 
uh, we're planning to run a, a little biochar experiment in our uh, chicken feed this year. Uh, but but we're talking to other people that have used it, and it's very, very mixed results. Uh, a lot of these things are real, you know, pretty hit and miss. And um, but we do the, the the one thing that we are pretty religious about is, you know, we do heat with wood. So we've got a lot of uh, clinkers and, you know, um, not not technically biochar, but certainly charcoal uh, from when we clean out the the wood furnace. And um, and we we we, uh, we sieve that out. We sort it out and we feed that charcoal to pigs. And uh, it's like a it's like a, a a tonic to pigs. They love it. And you can take a pig that you think is going to die tomorrow and feed it charcoal, and in a week it looks like it's ready for the county fair. So, um, uh, so there there are definitely uses, specific uses for it. And uh, yeah, we're uh, it's like you know it's like a lot of things. Um, there. There, there are more there are more things to try than I've got time for. Uh, I will tell you that this summer uh, in in uh, late August we're hosting a uh, a Colombian. He's the world guru of bio biological fertilizers, homemade. They call them bioferts, homemade bioferts. Um, and he's kind of the world leading guru. He's going to do a three day uh, three day seminar here at the farm, and we're really looking forward to that that time with him learning about that. Um, he's very involved with the campesino movement uh, in Latin and Central America with these small farmers, you know, weaning them off of fertilizer so that when Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine and fertilizer jumps 400 uh, percent, these guys can just thumb their nose and say, you know, I don't need it like we do. And that's really that's really a, that's a very exciting place to be. So and biochar, I think, is is part of a of, of an interesting package. Uh, and I'm, I'm not for it. I'm not against it. I, you know, we just haven't had time or at least made time for that to actually, you know, do a whole lot of experimenting with it. Okay. Last two viewer questions. Um, I just saw a video from a dairy farmer talking about feeding Skittles, rejected brownie batter, Oreos, and Snickers to their dairy cows and why this cheap source of energy might be a great upcycle. Has Joel heard of this? And if so, what are his thoughts? I did have uh, Will Harris, fellow regenerative farmer on uh, Void Oak Pastures, and he was the first person that told me about the the candy sure. and the honey buns, sure. as he says with his accent, the honey buns, uh, best Georgia right. accent out there. And he told me yeah. that they mash up the plastic wrapping too, that you're getting plastic wrapping in with it, which I found totally nuts. But uh, anyway, yeah, take it away, Joel. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, uh, what I think about it, uh, yeah, uh, it, for, to start off, it's true. Uh, cows have been, cows have been the repository of all sorts of refuse for many, many, many years. And um, and so, I mean, th that's that's what started the whole uh, undulant fever tuberculosis uh, uh, stuff going on in the late 1800s uh, with the swill dairies. Swill swill uh, dairies were were put up next to the next to the uh, beer brewers and in urban settings before refrigeration, uh, so the cows could eat the distillers grains from the brewery waste. Uh, so cows have been a dumping ground for all sorts of things for a long time. And of course, uh, as they say uh, I, uh, down south, uh, I, I'm again it. Um, you know, a, a, a cow is a fermentation tank that's supposed to take in uh, roughage and ferment it. She, she's basically a four-legged portable sauerkraut vat, and um, so you know that's that's what she's supposed to eat. And so, um, so all this this you know candy and and uh, you know a bakery waste and things like that. That cows are getting, uh, it 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 certainly um, it certainly doesn't make for healthy cows, uh, and and it, it certainly increases you know pharmaceuticals and vet bills and you know sickness and disease problems, and um, makes of course a, a less a less nutritious uh, milk and a more high risk milk that then you know mandatory uh, pasteurization. Uh, helps to overcome some of the riskiness of that of that milk. So yeah, I'm not I'm not in favor of that. I just I, it still boggles my mind though that because I've had a I had one dairy farmer write me and say that's just not true that no farmer would or at least most farmers wouldn't do that. They wouldn't, especially with the plastic wrapping thing. Will was like, well, how do you think, do you think they unwrap all of those things? Like they have somebody that spends hours to just unwrap nickel candy and then 
uh, feed it to the cow. So I I found the like, farmers are kind of even divided over. So I, obviously they are because there's some think it's great and others that don't think. How do you how do you guys communicate with each other about that topic? Um, is it seems like for some people it's, it's a no brainer, and then for other people it's like no, this is a great thing. I, it, it's so odd, hard, hard to understand from the outside. Well, you have to understand that there are there are in my view, there are good farmers and bad farmers. There's good food and bad food. And, uh, and, and not to just, you know, make everything black and white, but, but for the sake of discuss, for sake of discussion, let's just say that there's, there's, there's nutritious food and, and, and deficient food. There are good farmers and bad farmers. There are, there are farmers who build soil. There are farmers who destroy soil. Uh, there are farmers who in, who increase uh, biodiversity, and there are farmers who decrease biodiversity. I mean, it's just this thing. And 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 I can tell you that in the in the conventional farm circles, uh, when I when I speak in more conventional circles, like let's say I do something for the Farm Bureau Federation or or something, uh, they just they just want to tar and feather me when I'm not willing to say, oh, we're all farmers. And it's all for one, one for all, you know, we're all in this together. We're all farmers. No, oh, no, no, no. I, 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 I'm, I'm in a, I'm on a different planet than a Tyson chicken farmer. I'm on a different planet than a confinement dairy farmer or, or, or a, you know, a, a Cargill a GMO corn grower. I'm on a different planet. We're, we're not, we're not in the same ball game. We're not in the same paradigm. We're not in the same value system, belief system whatsoever. So I am not going to be pulled into, to this, you know, well, farmers say, no, 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 no. Um, uh, we're we're as we're as different in our beliefs and worldview as anybody can be, and so um, so so here we are now. Do, do I think that feeding plastic to cows should be? I mean, my my neighbor just up the road, two miles, uh, you know, they feed their cows uh, chicken chicken manure. You know, uh, it's a cheap, cheap source of protein and the cows eat chicken manure. And of course, when you cook the beef, it smells like manure. But, you know, most people don't know what beef should smell like. So, I was you know, wondering what it was this one time. Oh, my gosh. I never knew that. So my husband and I had steak like years ago. And I said, this tastes like S-H-I-T. You know, am I making this up? And he's like, it does. We ended up throwing it out because it was a gift, actually. I mean, I felt terrible about it, but I couldn't eat it. Um I, I, I didn't know what that was. I, th I thought, did the cow just live in the crap and it just, the aroma was just in the meat yeah. or so it actually ate crap. And that's what I, oh my God. Wow. All right. That, that's, that answers that question. There's, there, there's quite a, uh, Allison, there's quite an art. There's quite an art <laughs> at feeding them just enough uh, for them to, to cut some, some, you know, some uh, feed bills, but not enough that it actually taints the meat. And obviously I've got uh, a good cut, nose. Yeah. Cow, yeah. It was it was a little over the over the top there, but uh, you know that's done. So so should, do I think it should be illegal? No, I don't. I, I think I think people should should listen to programs like this, and become educated and informed so that they don't just buy unintentionally. They actually buy with intention. Um, you know, a, a word picture I use all the time is okay. So you're sitting over your plate. You're getting ready to eat. You're sitting over your plate. I want you to imagine squinting your eyes looking through that plate what's on the other side of it what's on think about it. what's on the other side of it is what's on the other side is that a landscape a, a, an economy a society that you want your children to inherit or is that or is that a society a landscape a, an ecology that is heading toward you know soil and green and and uh, uh you know exploitation and those kinds of, and, and tyranny, you know, what kind of landscape is on the other side of that? And I have found that to be a, a profoundly helpful question, not only for me, and, and I'm not a cultist, okay? I'm an 80-20 guy, all right? And some people hate me for saying 80-20. No, you should be a purist. You should eat, no, 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 no. You know, um, yesterday I ate a Snickers bar, okay? All right, guilty. I ate a, but you know what? It's the only one I've eaten in a year, all right? One, one Snickers bar in a year is not going to make a Snickers bar empire and it's not going to kill you. Okay. Um, and, and so I happened to be in an airport and, and a friend got it for me. And, you know, so here we are. And I wanted to bless my friend and eat the Snickers bar. Okay. So, um, so the, 
So my, my, my point here is 80-20. Do, do 80% right. And the 20% is so you can go over to your nieces uh, and have a, you know, and enjoy the birthday party right. with cake and ice cream and, and not be a bore and a pain to the family. All yeah, right. Nobody, it, it's just being a jerk sometimes when you, right? I, 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 you know what I think about what I, I tell people, it's my Pauline way of eating. Like if you invite me over, you know, the, the, it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of him that makes him unclean. Right. Um, and uh, so I, like, I'm not going to be the person that goes, I'm not eating your food. Like, where did you go shopping? Where did you get it? And I go through your It's like, all right, you invited me or I'm going to, but where I want to spend my money, I'm going to try to spend it where I, I, like you said, what I want to see on the other end of my plate. Yeah. 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 I, and I, I think that's a helpful thing. Uh, so just, you know, just take your time, um, you know, maybe, maybe as part of your as part of your blessing when you sit down to eat is to just imagine what's on the other side of that plate and is that is that a world i want my kids to inherit and and if it's not make a change if it is then keep keep patronizing it and uh, and and feed that as we, as the old chinese you know the little boy standing there and the, uh, two little puppies and the and the little boy asks his grandpa you know uh, which dog is going to grow and grandpa says the one you feed well um let's let, let, let's feed the let's feed the system that builds soil um, and is and is healthy for earthworms, healthy for pollinators, and uh, healthy healthy for our microbiome. Okay, final viewer question, um, which are kind of two questions in one. If you could snap your fingers and implement a solution, what would it look like? And then the follow up uh, from another viewer, Mike. So that's Lord Loser. And then Mike Sanderson says, and how do farmers markets fit into this? What are their restrictions? So are farmers markets part of your solution? And what are their restrictions? And, and if you could snap your fingers, uh, what would we see? Okay. So uh, what a great question. It's a wonderful one to, to, to conclude on. So if I, could, if I could be God for a day and snap my fingers, what I would do is have a uh, have a a, um, a food emancipation proclamation, uh, and I know I'm using very you know um, powerful terms here, uh, but what we have is we have an enslaved food system right now. Uh, you can't you can't get a, a you know a, a T-bone steak from your neighbor. You can't get uh, you know, sausage from your neighbor um, without it going through a government licensing program, which requires it being wrapped in a, you know, in a, in a, a million dollar facility with, um, you know, at, at a scale that's not neighborly uh, for the most part. And so, so if I could snap my fingers, it would be a food emancipation problem, uh, proclamation to free food from the enslavement of the bureaucratic food police so that anyone can get uh, can get food from the source of their choice um, from from a, a, a in a voluntary transaction and uh, basically a, a, a right to you know a right to choose your food um, uh, freedom and if we had that in this country um, it would it would free up thousands and thousands and, and I know they're here because I meet them all the time all over the country uh, people who are ready and willing to meet their neighborhood with uh, with not only unprocessed but also processed food um, you know uh, soups and and uh, uh, meat pies and you know you name it chicken broth whatever um, that that are ready to, to to meet this and and if that could happen, it would absolutely, it would absolutely dismantle, dismantle in in a year. It would dismantle the entire um, industrial food complex, because their margins are so small, so so tiny, that even a ten or fifteen percent share of the marketplace would completely crumble their um, uh, their entities and this this doesn't it doesn't take a bureaucrat it doesn't take a tax it doesn't take an agency it takes no regulators whatsoever it's just giving people freedom of choice as consenting adults to participate in a consensual transaction to choose what's going to feed my microbiome 
uh, that's that's how simple this is. We don't have that freedom in this country. In fact, judges have ruled that Americans do not have freedom of choice in their food. That that's a you know we we have we have. And, and and if Americans could ever understand what is missing from the store, you know, they go in the store. What do you mean I don't have choice on food? I got I got a supermarket here full of choice. Well, well, where's where's uh, where's Aunt Matilda's, um, you know, Aunt Matilda's pot pie? Where's Uncle Ben's, um, you know, uh, 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 sausage? Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's not there, and, and so. It's it's hard to create uh, to make people feel a need for something they don't even know that 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 they're missing. But if you've ever if you've ever eaten real food, authentic food from real people, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And um, and so that that lockhold that the that the food police have on our food choice right now is 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 hurting. Uh, it, it, it's creating ar arbitrary price problems. Um, I, I mean, our farm, we, if we had this freedom, we could sell our food 25% cheaper than we do because it has to go to a licensed government facility to be processed so that you can buy it. So we got to send it up the road, bring it back, you know, in order for a neighbor to get it. Th this is, you know, it's, it's it's obscene. It's un-American, and it and it's food slavery. And I'm going to use that word. It's food slavery, and so we need to take the shackles off of the food system and allow entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial opportunities in that marketplace to create com competition to the oligarchs that, that that you know that control that space. In 1906, when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, there were seven large corporations that controlled. 50% of America's feet, uh, um, meat, meat supply. Seven corporations controlled half of the nation's food supply, and they called that an oligarchy. Today, after a century of government involvement, we now have four that control 85%, and we call that a free market. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. I didn't even know it was that bad. <laughs> um, yeah. Well... Joel, I know you can't see this, but um, I'm showing a picture of my daughter when she was about a year old, standing next to the horse water trough with the horse, drinking out of it. She she started doing that on her own. And, yeah. um, you know, I didn't even have to tell her Joel Salatin does that to keep his gut healthy. I'm going to put you side by side with it. So you still drink out of the horse water trough or the cow water trough? I, I sure do. I drink out of cow water troughs. Uh, in fact, not even on our own farm. I was over down in a farm in uh, in uh, Mississippi recently doing a consult there for a new outfit, and uh, and I and the cows were there, so I walked over and uh, and drank out of their trough too. Might as well get some Mississippi, my you know Mississippi bugs as well. Table uh, versus kids that are in the city, and they've actually got uh, they're, they're trying to get how do we get uh, country. How do we get farm soil into the city so city kids can stomp around in farm soil to increase their microbiome? So, Allison, I've got a if you, if you have any uh, uh, entrepreneurial listeners, I've got a I've got a a proposition for you. I think what we need in this country is we need to start you know these welcome mats when you go to the front door. We need, we need bladders, uh, uh, permeable membrane welcome mats that we can stuff with with soil and compost. Uh, for urban people, it'll be a subscription service. Every quarter will come and we'll refill it, so your kids can go out and stop and, and get and get nice farm uh, farm dust over them to uh, to exercise their immu their immunity muscle. We have a lot a lot more uh, a lot more health. Another topic you could totally go down the rabbit hole on is is medicine, <laughs> modern medicine, and how you know depending on the doctor you talk to, they'd say that's nuts that I let my kid drink out of the horse water trough. And you know we have another doctor friend sent the picture to his naturopath in Seattle, and he's like, I love seeing a kid barefoot, you know, walking around, um, you know, or drinking out of you know in the dirt or drinking out of the <laughs> the horse water trough. That's great, but that's a whole nother. We'll we'll save that for another day. Joel, any final closing thoughts? It's really a pleasure to have you on I'm, I'm really grateful you took this kind of time for us oh no it's just my honor and privilege and thank you for what you're doing and bringing bringing the the minority view the the one thing that distinguishes free societies from from tyrannical societies is is how they offer a platform 
to the minority view. All great breakthroughs in, in history have come from the lunatic fringe, from a minority view, never from the establishment, never from the status quo. It's always the alternative view. And so, uh, so you know, what you're doing is offering a platform for those minority views to be, um, to be expressed, for people to be exposed to them, and then do your own research, your own sleuthing to, to, to pursue maybe that, that idea that you haven't heard on the mainstream news. You're doing a great service, Allison. Thank you and congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. So if everybody wants to go order from Polyspace Farms, they can find you on the internet. Uh, there's 16 books you can, well, 15 and then six, the 16th on the way, right, that you can read while you're eating it. Um, Joel Salatin, thank you so much. Thank you.